just oh, wow. to go page by page through this book, just repairing. <laughs> the, uh, but see, uh, the one benefit of that is that I, I really, I got to, I, I, I got to intimately know uh, every aspect that was written about Jeff in that book. That you know, really has it. You know, you were talking about the uh, uh, the one uh, book that you had that had about four pages of, uh, about Jeff. Well, you know, the Haunting of Cashin's Gap has all these details that probably hasn't really seen the light of days since it was originally printed in 1936 yeah a lot of the stuff i saw it, it was nowhere in there even there even some of the facts i think they got wrong now the, the wife's name was margaret right yes because they have her as marjorie i think i called her marjorie the entire episode no they got <laughs> Warrey right they got james right but i this is one of the things i wanted to mention uh i wanted to first talk about now the irvings they had two other kids guys did y'all know that they were yeah. full grown. Well, I learned that from from listening to Tim uh, that they were full grown. Yeah, they kids. had Elsie, Elsie, and Gilbert. Now, Gilbert, right. there was no mention of that. The book that I read and read to our listeners made it sound like they just were a nice old couple with a, you know, with one daughter that they doted on endlessly. But they had two grown kids that had already left. Now, was there any talk that the older kids, because they lived on Cashin's Gap briefly, right? The older mm-hmm. ones. Right, very briefly, uh, you know, maybe just a couple of years early on, probably, I think, even before uh, Vori was born. Uh, wow. But, you know, we don't, I have not been able to find anything about Gilbert, uh, the, the, the older oldest boy. Um, now, uh, Elsie, she was, by the time uh, the whole uh, Jeff uh, scenario started up, she was already a widow, so, uh, wow. Wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, but she, she remained, uh, she remained in England and when she, I guess when she would come and visit, there was not apparently a lot of love loss between her and her younger sister, Vori, you know, now you have to remember that, you know, Vori was born on the island. Uh, so, you know, she, uh, <laughs> really had not a lot of, um, relationship with uh with her older sister yeah, so that's... you know it, it, it would just almost be like a distant relative coming to visit every now and then yeah <laughs> that's, weird for, well that's weird for siblings i mean i know it's a different mm-hmm. time i mean this is the, the 20s uh, probably or the early 30s then well i guess it would have been the 20s before jeff would happen Vari would have been really young but another thing the you know the the book that i read made it seem like Jeff just kind of appeared fully formed in the walls, talking and banging. But, you know, according to your book, uh, that Jim, the older James, first saw him outside just as an animal. And he was just making animal noises and dog noises, right? Like he would meow like a cat or bark like a dog and he would repeat it back to him. Mm-hmm. There, there were there actually there's two two stories. There was um, the original letter that was sent to Harry Price, uh, letting him know that there was something weird going on uh, on the island. Came from uh, a, a neighbor of the Irvings, and she, in her letter, she said that Jim and Vori actually saw some kind of of weasel like animal, in, you know, in the farmyard that was you know making weird noises and you know scampering about. And then later, it uh, apparently got in the house. Now, uh, Jim. When he wrote back to Harry Price initially, he didn't mention that part. He just said that uh, uh, one day they he they noticed that uh, there was something in the walls. And, you know, of course, you know, you're in a in a farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere. Of course, there's something in the walls. There's always something in the walls. <laughs> you know, uh, and and he laid out you know traps and poisons, thinking you know it was mice and rats, but none of that worked. And uh, out of frustration, he barked at it like a dog. And whatever this thing was, it barked back. (laughs) And uh, and that's how it started. You know, Jim would bark again or meow or make other some other kind of noise. And this thing would would parrot the noise back. And uh, and and it progressed from there. Right. So it progressed to. He was started making like gurgling sounds like a baby in the wall. And that's mm-hmm. kind of when they really knew that this wasn't probably just an animal. And I love this from the book. The first actual words that they've got Jeff saying is, 
Doma, Doma, Doma. Blum, blum, blum. It's just like almost <laughs> total nonsense. I had to get my Jeff impression there. This, this could use like a, a movie treatment so badly. Like the imagine the Conjuring two, but with with this instead. This story, it would just it it would be incredible. That's it's of... you know it's a great story, but you know I mean Hollywood would Halloween Hollywood eyes it so <laughs> they would badly. they would. I mean, you know, it would it would have like you know Jeff reaching out from the wall and tearing people's faces <laughs> off, and, right. you know, and thing, things like that. I, you know, I mean, look, look what they did to the Travis Walton. Uh, oh oh yeah. yeah, that's you know, yeah. that's a classic yeah, story for us for sure. Don't get Christopher Walken to play James Irvin so he can do his <laughs> do his improv. Jeff in the wall, doma doma, blum blum. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, and but if okay, Hollywood would screw it up. But it's weird that there's not even, not even. I don't think unsolved mysteries or in search of or any of that ever touched it. I mean, maybe in search of did. It's probably not. Uh, you know, it's not a lot. We just recently did an episode where we went over an old Leonard Nimoy in search of, and oh, those were so good. We did Coral Castle, and man, this they don't make them like really they used cool. to. I'm really telling cool. you, yeah. So, and no, it is uh, really crazy that, that no one's picked up on it. Like, you know, I've been following weird beyond belief, you know, and, and outer limits and things like that for a long, long time. And I've never, ever, ever heard of this. And for it, it is a strange synchronicity. It makes sense that, you know, you have just uh, the timeline of you putting this book out and then, you know, the uh, coast to coast and uh, midnight in the desert interviews. But it's so weird that Russ also just like kind of brought it up when he's had this book for a while is uh your other one what was that one called russ it's yeah it's called out of this world it was a it's a series of books you can find them on amazon they actually they, they are actually becoming rare books this is the only yeah uh, it's like a long series of books but this is the only one i have and i was just looking for, i mean i'll be honest i was looking for some show ideas I'm like what's something that might be in here that maybe people haven't heard of and it came along with jeff so out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, and I, I want to tell you, Tim. So I, I was on uh, Coast to Coast uh, about a week or so ago, and uh, not like you as a guest, I had to call in like the rest of our schlubs. But I got, <laughs> I got, I got through to George, and I kind of told him the story that you did. So I, I kind of inadvertently plugged the book again. We talked to Jeff. Uh, to jo I talked to George about Jeff a little <laughs> bit. <clears throat> He was nice enough to actually let me plug this show too. So this was last uh, Friday night open line. So oh let you know. great! Well, thank you. <laughs> I yeah. pre I appreciate you the uh, doing the uh, the plug. I mean, with hey. a book like with a book like this, you know, you need all the help you can. <laughs> <laughs> and with a show like this, we need all the help we can yeah. get. <laughs> if George, if George didn't hang up on my face, and I had something I could actually converse with him about, and it was, it, it, we're fr we're great friends now. So uh, anyway, we love George. We love George. <laughs> we do. So it moved on from you know, Doma Doma Blum Blum, and now now Vori's talking with it. And see, we you know, like I said in this book, he seemed fully formed. He was talking, but she kind of taught Jeff to speak more by just doing nursery rhymes with him, right? And he would repeat them back as oh. like you know, it's like almost like he was going through a growth period. Where he's learning words, he's repeating words, and then he's repeating these uh, nursery rhymes. But then he's starting to actually talk to to James just on his own. He's not repeating. He's well, sentient. He's you know speaking you know his own mind. And I like how they they first call him Jack, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They 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 called him Jack, and right right away they thought that they were dealing, and naturally so, with a ghost. Yeah, because I mean, face it, you know, you're hearing something talking back to you in the walls. You know, you're gonna think that uh, your house is haunted, and, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 naturally, I mean, you know, some of the stuff that Jeff would do was very ghost-like, very poltergeist. You know, uh, I mean, he would, uh, you know, knock on the walls. He would uh, uh, steal things. Uh, he would throw uh, rocks and packing needles and, you know, what, whatever out of uh, little tiny cracks in the, uh, in, in the wainscoting. So, uh, and, and once it did start to talk, and and exhibit you know intelligence and sentience then they couldn't get it to shut up it <laughs> it, it talked 
constantly. I mean, and it's, it's, it, Jeff especially loved to talk at night when they were trying to go to bed. You know, I mean, you have to realize that, I mean, you know, th- this they were farmers, even though that, you know, uh, Jim Irving had originally wanted to be a gentleman farmer, you know, that uh, he would own the farm and then he would have uh, hired help uh, come oh. in. To, so, and so he's not growing gentlemen. He, that's not his crop. <laughs> right, no. <laughs> okay. He, he only grew he grew the one Gilbert and he never came back, so he had to, <laughs> had to try something different. <laughs> but yeah. Um so and uh, about Voire. Now Voire and Jeff at first seemed a, a bit inseparable and I guess they kinda had a falling out later, but uh, you know, I read in your book that there was a um a woman who was a classmate of Voire's and she she said that Voire could do great animal impressions and quote unquote throw her voice or mm-hmm. ventriloquism. She was kind of throwing her under the bus on that, but that well, yeah, that that, that was years later too at you know uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, for a, a local radio station there on the island. Oh, so, I wonder. So I wonder how much. I wonder how much that friend was paid to start mm. spreading yeah, that exactly. false information. Or well, <laughs> right, you know, right from the very beginning, and, and in fact, there are uh, uh, newspaper headlines uh, from that time that uh, uh, basically insinuate that Vori was a ventriloquist and was, you know, hoaxing everybody like this. You know, at that time, ventriloquism. Uh, was also called throwing your voice, and uh, people actually believe that a you know a ventriloquist could make his voice you know sound like it's you know you know come out from the closet or under the bed or something like that. You know we we know now that that's not true. A ventriloquism, it's you know it's like a, a magic trick. It's all a matter of distraction. That's why you have the ventriloquist dummy. So to say that Vori was able to throw her voice from across the room or something like that, that's that's really just kind of silly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And she definitely and... couldn't be throwing needles at people through the gaps in the walls either. So, oh, no, you know, no. How to explain that, you know? <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I mean, you know, and she probably was really good. You know, I mean, she you know, grew, you know, grew up on a uh, on a farm in the middle of, of nowhere. She probably could uh, <laughs> do all kinds of, you know, animal noises and things, you know, things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd be a shame if she couldn't. Yeah, something she that, that fascinated me about it was, like, the progression of intelligence of, of mm-hmm. Jeff. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you've ever heard of with, like, um, a poltergeist or, like, a haunting? Like, the, the haunting itself getting smarter throughout, like, the progression of it? Is that... Is oh, that... yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, a poltergeist type of haunting uh, uh, investigated parapsychologists have actually gone and uh, uh, and made like uh, come up with a list of different levels of poltergeist activities. And, you know, one of them, you know, like level one is just the, you know, like the knocks on the wall or maybe a little bit of, you know, the moving around of furniture. And, you know, level two then is the moving of heavy furniture, um, uh, uh, things disappearing and reappearing at various places, you know, and on and on. And, you know, the top level is then um, like uh, almost like a, a, a possession of mm-hmm. people in the house talking uh talking a talking poltergeist is is very rare but i mean we have a, a number of cases like the bell witch uh, uh poltergeist oh, or haunting yeah. In, mm-hmm. in in Tennessee in the uh, or in the 19th century uh you know and you know that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, I've speculated, and I'm not the only one, that Jeff may have been, you know, like a type of poltergeist haunting, mm-hmm. uh, with the exception that, um, you know, he lasted for almost 10 years mm-hmm. when when most poltergeists really, you know, I mean, you know, maybe a couple of years at the extreme. You know. Right, right. Yeah. That usually well, occurs during, a, like, when a, when a when a child is reaching puberty and, and their energy is all haywire, right? That's usually the amount of time that the poltergeist is most active? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. I mean, it's not, you know, with with any of this kind of stuff, I mean, you know, you've got a template kind of that you can work off of, but, um, you know, there there are variations in every single, you know, direction when it comes comes to this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff seems to be one of the most extreme variations uh, when it comes to this just really bizarre paranormal type of activity and you know and i and i do want to stress 
uh, that uh, I, I seriously do not think that whatever Jeff was, that he was an actual physical animal living in the wall of the walls of this house that that could talk uh, you know and and do some of the other fantastic things you know there 